okay. Oh. Welcome all and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Doreen Anderson, Senior Knowledge Exchange Manager for AHDB Dairy in Scotland. We have a great lineup for you today. I'm joined with Gareth Owen, our student to dairy farmer from Pottstown near Lockerbie, and his vet Callum Cameron from Arc Vets in Lockerbie, Colin Mason from SRUC, and Jimmy Goldie, who will be joining me in a couple of minutes, hopefully, um, and two local dairy farmers, local to Gareth, Willie Fleming and Craig Davidson. Welcome, everybody. This webinar yeah. is part of the GB Dairy Calf Strategy Week. I'll give you more details nearer the end of this webinar. I'll cover some housekeeping rules with you now. All attendees are muted. And if you would like to please type questions into the chat box. If we don't get time to answer all of them today, we will get back to you. Messages are private and we won't mention your name when we're reading them out. If you're a Dairy Pro member, can you please type your name, farm name and membership number into the question box to register your points. If you've forgotten your uh, membership number, please type in your email address. Today's webinar has been recorded and you will be available on, on the website and on YouTube. And we're aiming to finish today at 1.30. The agenda for today is that you will meet Gareth, who is our strategic dairy farmer from Pottstown. You will hear from Colin Mason on calf health, and Jimmy Goldie is going to talk about weaning growth and nutrition. We're going to hopefully make this a bit interactive, and you'll hear from Callum and William and Craig and Gareth about bringing some of these practices and protocols into life. So what is our strategic dairy farm network? At the moment, we've got 19 across the UK, and we're aiming for over 20 over the summer. Gareth's one of our strategic dairy farms based in just outside Lockerbie in Scotland, and we've also got another strategic dairy farm in Scotland, who is Will A. Wallace Henry, based up in Ayrshire at Millen's Farm, who's a spring block cabin herd. So enough from me. Um, I'm going to come over to Gareth. Um, and I'd like Gareth, if you can, if you don't mind joining me here just now, giving a bit of an introduction to Pottstown. And for those listening who've not already seen or heard from you, tell us a little bit of what you've been up to recently. Thanks, Doreen. I uh, just like to welcome everybody along as well. Uh, it's nice to nice to get going with the strategic dairy farm, and uh, yeah, it was nice to have the meeting in face in person as well with so many people turning up in january it was very good uh, i'm gareth owen i am one of the partners at Pottstown farm uh, it's a family-run dairy farm as Doreen says just about six miles south of lockerbie uh, we farm roughly 380 acres uh, here it's mainly grassland we are exclusively dairy we milk robotically milk 260 cows at the moment uh, we came to Pottstown in 1988 and added on the next door Scottsbrig farm in 2014. Uh, that got us up to our current acreage. Uh, in 2015, uh, well, sorry, in 2012, we, we put two robotic milkers in. And once we put Scottsbrig farm in as well, we put another two in and that boosted our cow numbers up to where we are today. Uh, we supply U3 dairy. Uh, we have done since 2016. We're an all year round calving, obviously on the robots to keep a nice level profile. We're a, we want a traditional high input herd. Uh, the cows don't go out to graze at all. The, the dry cows and the young stock do. We try to be a closed herd, but uh, and a couple of years ago, we had a little bit of a farming policy change and brought in a hundred Danish jerseys into the herd. So going forward, we're looking at being 50% Alstein pedigree cows and 50% pedigree jerseys. Uh, if you can maybe move the slide along, Doreen, please. Uh, as I say, it's a family run business, uh, mainly me and my dad that uh, do most of the farm work. So in the middle of the photo there is my dad, Tom, and my mum, Christine. On the right hand side is myself and my wife, Annette, and my two children, Charlie and Chloe. And on the left hand side of the photo is my brother David and his wife Linda and their twins Callum and Ailey. 
David is a partner in the business, but he is his full time job is with his own consultancy firm, uh, Owen Farm Services. If you could move it along again, please, Dorian. So, on top of myself and my dad, we have two full time members of staff. We're very lucky; they're exceptionally good staff members that we have. Uh, and the the left hand picture there is Kenny, who has been with us for over five years now, as a form, former dairy farmer himself. He treats the, treats the cattle in the place like his own. It's it's very much uh, we're very lucky to have him. He's a general farm worker and does most of the cow, uh, most of the cow feeding and a lot of the tractor and field work that gets done. And also we have Jody who joined us about three years ago. She came for from work experience because she wanted to get into being a vet. Uh, she came for a month and she's never left. So she does general farm work as well, but she her, she's more focused on the young stock and calf rearing, which is quite relevant to today. If we could move it on again, please, Doreen. So as I say, in 2014-15, we bought the next door farm and we coincided that with building the, the dairy shed that we have at the moment. Uh, you know, we've got the cow, cow numbers up to the sort of 250, 260 uh, on the four robots. And then added in 2020 with the the hundred jerseys that we bought. The, the plan is to split that shed up the middle to have jerseys on one side and Holsteins on the other. The main reason for that was being a U tree supplier. They don't have a a top limit on what they pay you for your constituents, so it made makes financial sense, I think, to to do that. We've yet to see the full results of it, so I think in a few years' time we will see whether there might be a question whether we go all Jersey or whether whether we don't. As I say, we 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 have traditionally been a high input herd, and I think probably with costs over the last few years, it's something we're trying to push to get more from forage and get the most we can. You know, with still feeding them quite hard as well, but you know things like the Lely dynamic feeding we were on for a while to try and cut the amount of cake that we were feeding them because uh, we felt we'd maybe just got to the stage where we were pushing the cows just that little bit too hard. Uh, we're still sort of reading the results of that and seeing how we're getting on, but as a herd, we're now we're average across the Goldsteins and Jerseys is sitting about 8,500. Uh, we're sending milk away at just over the 5% fat and 3.7 to 3.8 protein. Uh, Crop-wise, as I say, we're mainly grass-based, but we do grow between 40 to 60 acres of, of whole crop of varying descriptions uh, to feed to the cows and the young stock. We have tried maize in the past, but I think our ground is just that little bit too heavy, and I think in a bad year we might get severely caught out. Most of the tractor work is undertaken by a local contractor, Graham Ray. Uh, we do the odd bits and pieces like rolling and the odd bit of sludge spread and the stuff ourselves. Uh, we work very closely with Art Vets Limited. Callum comes in roughly once a fortnight, sometimes more, unfortunately, just to, to catch up. And we get to get a lot out of that. And I, I, it's very much appreciated having a good relationship with the vet. Uh, our aims going forward are to try and maximise our what we're getting out of the cows and I think that ties back to today's meeting because the the basically that that cow's life is set in the first few weeks to months of its life and you can you can do a hell of a lot to to get stuff out of them by doing it properly at the beginning I'm I'm hoping over the next year or two to have a young stock selling enterprise or mainly calved heifers to be honest and to that end that was Part of why we did the strategic dairy farm is to try and learn and do things better and get ideas from different people. And uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying it at the minute. Uh, to bring you up to date on what we've done recently, we've just just in the last week or two have genomically tested all of our young stock under a year old jerseys and Holsteins uh, through Zoetis. So it's, that's, it's very much something I was quite excited to do and will definitely be able to track these calves right through to hopefully first or second lactation through the course of being a strategic dairy farmer. Uh, but again, just like to say how good it is for everybody to be here today and hand back to Doreen, if that's okay. 
Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, and something else that we're both looking forward to is getting back onto the farm and actually getting onto the farm visit, which is going to be happening in March for you. And we're looking at the cows and the optimising, the feed and the forage and the performance based on some of the tests that you've been doing recently. So just on the calves, you've been, I don't know if Callum wants to just come in here just very quickly. We'll just introduce what you've sort of implemented just over the last few months, just looking on the calf side of things. Um, we've You've got a, a few trials going on, haven't you, in the background, and we'll hopefully in another six, 12 months be sharing that data and, and what you've been seeing. Gareth, uh, Callum, do you want to just give us a wee bit of insight into what's what's happening just now yeah, from your perspective? Uh, Gareth will probably open them himself. Obviously, well, expansion often calf accommodation doesn't... Uh, sometimes suffers behind the milking cows. So currently they are uh, rearing their calves in a shed, which has certain limitations. So we're obviously concerned with that, but we are recording birth weights and growth rates every two weeks going forward. We're also measuring colostrum level uh, on every calf that's born. So, you know, that information has been quite powerful to us, to us already to see where we are and uh, what we can do to change going forward. So. It actually has been quite an eye opener, or something that we almost take for granted in terms of colostrum management. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been valuable for everyone, including myself. Lovely, thank you. And I think we'll come, Jimmy and and Colin. I'll bring you in and and cover a bit more of that going forward. So, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, move on this slide, uh, Colin. If you want to come into the screen, please. Thank you, Gara. Oh. Sorry. Thank you, Colin. Welcome. Um, and I'm just going to hand straight over to you uh, for the next part. That's great. Can you just go back a slide, please, Doreen? Is that all right? Am I, am I not on the first no, you're not. slide? Go back one. There we go. No, I'd move back another one. There we go. That's perfect. Mm. No, oh, no. that one <laughs> that's the one perfect okay uh that's great thank you very much and uh good afternoon everybody um i want to spend the next 20 minutes or so um maybe just introducing some of the uh the, the key topics around calf health um it, it's a subject area that we could talk about for days rather than minutes therefore um i'm particularly focusing on a few areas um and we can maybe discuss that word further with the farmer group that's here today and obviously take any questions and try and answer them uh, as we go along as well um i think how i wanted to start was really just emphasizing the challenges of um rearing dairy calves um they are um a very very precious resource on dairy farms they are the future of the dairy herd and so much uh, of a, a cow's life is set uh, in the very, very early days of its life in terms of if we can get the calf health right in the first eight to 12 weeks um, and we can ensure that they get off to a good healthy start and grow well, then that really does set the course for how that heifer will grow on in her life, um, how she'll yield, how healthy she'll be and how she performs. So really, really important. And young baby calves, uh, particularly at this time of year when they come out they're particularly vulnerable um, uh, and in particularly with regard to infectious disease um, at birth um, they are quite susceptible they have uh, no antibodies on board to protect from disease until we get colostrum into them uh, on the other side of their immune system they have a, a poorly developed cell mediated immunity to fight off disease in the early days um, and in the immediate period after birth um, they're also pretty stressed because they've just gone through the birth process so they have high levels of, of cortisol floating around their system which makes them more susceptible to disease and and, and to have a poorer immune response so they're challenged right from the start and therefore the amount of looking after that we give them is really really important uh, the other points on this slide, I don't want to emphasize every one of them, but we know uh, as an industry that um, we need to constantly be striving to improve in that uh, we know that our calf mortality rates um, on some farms can can be improved. Uh, we know that the levels of scour and pneumonia, the two common diseases that we see 
in dairy calves are still quite high and therefore we've we've all got scope for improvement i think and it's an area where we can make quite a big difference which is why it's a great subject to talk about today so i thought i'd actually start by by saying a little bit more about what we see in my job as the main causes of calf ill health in scotland um if you can move on to the next slide please dorian um, and I'm going to acknowledge my colleague Trina in doing this and that what she did, if you move on to the next slide, is uh, review all of our findings through um, our disease surveillance centres in Scotland, looking at the main causes that we see of calf mortality. Um, it's obviously a slightly biased sample set in that it's looking at calves that people have submitted to us. but. The good thing is, is is that it gave us quite a high number of calves. It gave us over 600 calves to review the records of, and it gave us over a thousand diagnoses. So it gave us plenty to go at in terms of, well, what are we seeing in Scotland in dairy calves in the pre-weaning stage? If you move on to the next slide, please. And probably what we've got here, these are the top 10, and I suppose no major surprises um, in this, in that the top four are all common causes of um, calf scour. Uh, we've got navel ill and septicemia, and then we've got a range of causes of calf pneumonia. And I'm not going to go through every one of these, and I'm, uh, we'll maybe pick a few of them out uh, as we go through the talk today. But I suppose one thing I would point out at this stage, uh, which was perhaps a slight surprise to us when we were looking at this information, was um, what we would call room and drinking, and the numbers of cases of room and drinking that we saw and how relevant that was in terms of nutritional causes to the whole picture of calf ill health. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. And I thought I'd just focus a little bit on pneumonia and respiratory disease. It's, um, it, it's something that's been particularly relevant on most dairy farms through what's been a fairly challenging November, December in particular, uh, with, with quite dramatic changes in weather, temperature, et cetera. Um, and then when we look at the sort of cases of pneumonia that we see and that we diagnose, the vast majority of these will be bacterial causes of pneumonia. Um, so pastorella pneumonia, mycoplasma bovis, salmonella Dublin, um, and uh, a slightly smaller proportion will be viral causes, uh, although probably we would estimate and, and recognize that a lot of these pneumonia cases start off as viral. And the, the little schematic that I've got on the right of this picture really just does emphasize how I would want us all to see pneumonia in that it really is a uh, what we would call a pathogen soup in that it is a classic disease syndrome where there will be a range of pathogens involved. Um, and always will be the case that there is a mixture of bugs involved. It's rarely a sort of a single agent, a single bacteria or virus that's involved. Um, and a lot of what we're talking about will be that these, these bugs are common on all farms, uh, are present on most farms, and, and it's how we manage the calf's immunity and how we manage the environment and the environmental stresses um, that are gonna make the biggest difference to you know, how the, the outcome is for that calf in terms of, of pneumonia. So moving on to the next slide, just just something to think about really, and it's something where there's no set answer. And, and what I've highlighted on this slide actually is um, just some examples really. Uh, but I think it's really important that any farmer thinks about targets for pneumonia treatments um, in terms of what is an acceptable treatment rate for respiratory disease in calves before uh, they're weaned. Um, and I guess like any target, it needs to be relevant to a farm and it needs to be farm specific. So I suppose the first question is, is well, where are you on your farm now in terms of what proportion of calves are you treating for pneumonia um, over a period of time? Um, there are some examples there um, in terms of a survey that was done in Wales a number of years ago uh, put a figure of 20% of carps treated for pneumonia. Studies in um, southeast of England showed that just short of 50% of calves in one study were affected by pneumonia. And there's some American data that would suggest around about 35% of calves uh, are treated for respiratory disease at some point in the pre-weaning phase. Um, and therefore, I guess, how does your farm measure up to those targets? Um, 
what is an acceptable target and it's worthwhile maybe thinking about that as part of the health planning process and i would would challenge a couple of things obviously we want to sort of have that figure as low as possible um, obviously the less respiratory disease that we can get the better our preventative medicine strategies are the better it is but i would worry a little bit and i do worry a little bit if if those figures are really really low um, because my question then is is well not how many cases do you have but potentially how many cases are we missing um, and are we are we struggling to pick up some of the more subtle cases of respiratory disease that might be affecting carbs and if you move on to the next slide um, this is some weight gain data for carbs at the strategic dairy farm at Potsdam and um, the the weight gains that are shown in that graph um, that Gareth kind of gave me and Callum gave me was show, show a real mix of, of weight gains as you'd expect and I think on all farms you will see that there are some calves that are growing really well there are other grow, calves that are growing roughly on target and then there are a few outliers down at the sort of um, uh, you know 0 0.2 0 0.3 type of area where the growth rates are are lower and uh, one of the questions and I suppose one of the, the challenges there is are those ill health cases are those respiratory disease cases are they cases that have been treated and picked up by the farm in which case uh, it's good that they've been detected and managed or are some of these cases where where we might have missed them and that's something that, that Callum's going to be looking at in the next few weeks and months is actually uh, looking further and scanning the lungs of some of these calves to see uh, what we're seeing on scans and and how that might relate to growth rates and it feeds into that general topic of well what are we seeing what are we treating and what are we missing? Because some of these early cases of pneumonia and, and maybe subclinical cases of pneumonia, if we call them that, they can be quite subtle and quite hard to pick up. They can be quite hard to pick up early. They will be having an effect on calf performance. And in the general sphere of trying to um, uh, target our treatments as appropriately as possible to treat the right calves at the right time uh, and be as targeted as possible, it's really important that we, we look at ways of picking them up. So some food for thought there. If we can move on to the next slide, please. What I really want to focus on for the rest of this talk for about the next 10 or 15 minutes is really what underlies us so much of um, the early life calf health, which is colostrum management and trying to ensure that colostrum immunity is as good as possible. Um, if you look at uh, UK studies, it depends which one you look at, somewhere between about 14 and 26% of calves experience a failure of passive transfer, as in they don't get enough colostrum immunity, enough antibodies to provide them with the, the immune protection that they need. And that is certainly associated with, with a lot of the ill health and a lot of the calf death issues that we see in early life. Um, the way we assess failure of passive transfer or, or colostrum take up, um, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. But I think it's also important to, to think about calves as individuals in that if we if we put calves into a high challenge environment with a lot of you know environmental challenge with organisms, then their immune systems are going to be particularly challenged, and you know their cholesterol requirements might be even higher than they would if we put them into a, a very clean, well managed environment. And it just shows the the importance of that. Um, and there's a huge range of factors that will influence uh, um, how well colostrum is is taken up by the calf. And it really comes down to probably the last four bullet points on that slide of colostrum quality, colostrum quantity, um, cleanliness of the colostrum, and how quickly we feed there. And I'll pick up on a few of these points in a minute. But where I actually wanted to start was was with the calf itself, if we can move on to the next slide. And this is a really interesting piece of work. So this is before we get colostrum into calves and it's, it's the calf as it is born. And this is some work that was done in beef calves in Canada. Um, but you know, in this context, a calf is a calf. And what they did as part of this piece of work is, is they looked and they graded carvings into three different categories, unassisted where the cow carved herself, um, an easy assist where the, the, the farmer just had to give a, a quick pull to the calf or a quick reposition to the calf to get it out and then what they class as a difficult assist where there was significant intervention to get the calf out a vet may have been involved um, or moving as far as the cesarean section 
So they classified carvings in three different ways, and then they assessed the suck reflex as soon as the calf was born, um, or within an hour of the calf being born. Um, and just simply by sticking uh, fingers in a calf's mouth to see how strongly it sucked the, the farmer's fingers or the researcher's fingers, um, and, and described suck reflex as either weak or strong. Um, and then they looked at all of that data in relation to whether the calf consumed colostrum, uh, sufficient colostrum within the first four hours of life. Um, and I found this really interesting that even in unassisted carvings, um, calves with a weak suck reflex, 78% of them failed to consume sufficient colostrum within the first four hours. Um, and you can see as you go into the difficult category uh, with a weak suck reflex, you get up to nearly 100% of calves failed to consume enough colostrum within the first four hours. So the calf as it's born is so critical to the whole process. If you could move on to the next slide, please. And I want to just introduce, I don't want to dwell for a long time on, on stillbirths in the dairy herd, but, but stillbirths are important. Um, and I would really view stillbirths as, as, as in the same category um, as all the other transition cow diseases. So in the same category as milk fever um, and hung cleansings, um, metritis, LDAs, stillbirths to me come into that category. Um, and obviously a stillborn calf is a, a loss to the to the to the farm, uh, and probably target stillbirth rates that we would be aiming for is to try and get less than five percent of of all calvings. Um, but really, in the context of colostrum and and calf health, um, you've got to view it again like an iceberg disease. In that the stillbirths are very much the tip of the iceberg that you see above the water level, and then below the water level and just below the water level there will be another batch of carvings where the calf is alive but it very much is compromised at birth and therefore is less likely to absorb or drink enough colostrum and if it does get given enough colostrum it's not going to absorb it as well so uh, if we've got a high still birth rate in a herd then i think we could expect that there may be further issues with calves that are born alive but are going to fail to to take on enough colostrum in the first six hours um, and therefore again reviewing still birth rates and reviewing suck reflexes are really important take-home messages that i think everybody can can get a lot from if we look at still births in, in their own context it's quite interesting because probably 50 percent of them will be just oxygen starved calves through the birth process they'll be alive at the start and they'll just be um, uh, denied oxygen through the process probably about a quarter of them might be related to trauma and a much smaller percentage of them will be in association with, with traditional veterinary territory of infectious disease or, or congenital deformity. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So what happens if we get a slow or a difficult calving? Well, we know that the calf is, is starved of oxygen. Um, there will be a buildup of lactic acid to some degree. And it's possibly best to describe that as a little bit like a, a, a poison to a newborn calf in that the calf will be dopey. Um, uh, it will have a slightly suppressed heart rate and lung function. It'll take longer to stand. It will have a poor suck reflex. And I think the real issue uh, is, is that even if we put enough colostrum into that calf, um, let's say through a stomach tube, uh, then it will not absorb it as well. So we could put the right volume of colostrum into that calf, but it won't absorb it as well. So um, that's something that we really, really have to bear in mind. The other one with it is, is, is that these calves, they start off acidotic right from uh, from really hour one if they have a, a slow or a difficult calving and this will compromise what we call the function of the esophageal groove which was uh, really a sort of an anatomical um, adapting of, of the calf stomachs that ensures that we get milk into the right place and so what we're trying to do is get milk or colostrum into the fourth stomach, into the abomasum of a calf. And if a calf has a slow calving and is slightly acidotic at birth, then that whole process will be less effective. If you could move on to the next slide, a lovely picture for a lunchtime, but this is probably what we see at PM from an end stage of that process in that this is a calf where there's a huge amount of milk that's ended up in the rumen, uh, where it will then be fermented. 
um, uh, it will lead to, to secondary ruminal disease, um, and it will lead to severe, severe acidosis in these calves. Um, and it becomes a little bit of a vicious circle in that if a calf starts off at life as acidotic, then if that runs its course, then we could end up with, with some of these issues that I described at the start, which are called rumen drinking, which we see quite commonly where milk ends up in the rumen uh, where it shouldn't be. If we could move on to the next slide, please. So just a quick rattle through. We mentioned a lot already about colostrum absorption and we focused entirely on the calf and the calf probably just as soon as it hits the ground. Um, just a few points to bring out in terms of how we can uh, quantify failure of passive transfer and colostrum quality. Um, and there's two sides of this. We can look at the calf and if we look at the calf, really what we need is the calf to have 10 grams per litre of immunoglobulin. That's what she needs. Uh, and there are proxies for this. Um, firstly, we could look at blood total protein or we could look at uh, blood um, ZST levels. And, and this is something, again, that I would strongly advise every dairy farmer to do with their vet is keep monitoring um, uh, total proteins, ZSTs, whichever choice you want to make, keep monitoring that on an ongoing basis to see how things are going. Uh, hopefully that will reassure you that your colostrum management is going well. It'll highlight if it doesn't, and it can um, then sort of set about a process whereby you can review some of the areas where it might not be working as well as it could. So there are definitely tools based on blood testing where we could assess um, the whole process of, of passive transfer of, of immunoglobulins. Um, it would be lovely in the future to get a non-invasive test to look at this, um, uh, but we don't have that yet, so we're still looking at, at blood samples to do that. But they're easy got, and um, herds that are on regular routine visits like Pottstown um, it is something that, that can be done really easily. The other side of it is looking at what we put into the calf in terms of colostrum and making sure that it is the right quality. Um, and by right quality, what we're really looking at is, is, is greater than 50 grams per litre. Um, and probably the best proxy that we can make of that is using um, a BRICS refractometer um, uh, and the, the cutoff specific gravity that we're looking at there is 22%, which will help uh, in terms of ensuring that we put the right quality colostrum into calves. If we could go to the next slide, please. There are other assessments that you can make of colostrum quality. There's the colostrometers, which are quite simple and work really, really well. They're probably less effective at picking up the poorer quality colostrum. So if we're ever uh, using one of these, then you know, be pretty critical in terms of not just the, the colostrum that's in the red zone, but maybe some that's in the yellow zone as well, just to make sure that we are selecting the best quality stuff. Uh, and we need to temperature collect correct that as well, in that it, 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 it will work differently in colder weather at this time of year. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So we, we've talked a little bit about the calf. We've talked about um, the measuring failure of passive transfer and colostrum quality. And a, a few comments on administration route, because uh, this is a, always one to discuss. Um, different farms will do different things. Uh, and I'm very conscious as a vet, as it's not me that's, that's feeding these calves. Um, stomach tubing is, is quick effective ensures that the job will get done um, there have been a few questions raised about whether this is a standard technique is the way forward for the industry in terms of calf welfare uh, and you know whether we need to be trying to optimize using suckling from a teat as much as we can um, what's the interesting thing in terms of failure of trust of pa passive transfer is, is is that you will get uh, far higher rates of failure of passive transfer if we allow the calf to suckle its dam naturally um, and stomach tubing and bottle feeding will will lead to improvements in that uh, without a doubt uh, if we could move on to the next slide please the other point is volume in terms of how much we need to get into a calf and i think this is an important one just to talk about uh, for me the key measure is 10% of body weight uh, in the first six hours. And that assumes 
um, that there will be variable quality of colostrum. Um, it's making an assumption that some of it might not be as good. And I think it's just really, really important to know the weight of your carbs. Um, uh, you know, what is the birth weight of carbs? Is it 40 to 50? Is it 30 to 40? It will turn very much on, on breed and, and breeding strategies. Um, and it's important really so that we don't overfill carbs with colostrum. Um, and it's important also just to be very, very mindful of how quickly carbs are uh, removed from the dams, how much time they spend with the dams and the practicalities of all of that in terms of how much colostrum we, we give them. So uh, as general advice, three liters in the first couple of hours, uh, a further three liters in the next six to 12 hours as, as general advice, but it will depend very, very much on the, the setup uh, whether calves stay for a long period of time with their mothers uh, and as you say the weight of the calves themselves when they're born next slide please so yeah these are some colostrum results from Pottstown um, uh, I'll maybe bring that in at the end and, and let uh, Gareth and, and Callum talk about that a little bit more and we can we can bring that in in the discussions at the end and, and just talk a little bit more about what what they're doing so I'll move on a sec if we can into the next slide the other thing I just want to end on and I think this is a really really important one is is colostrum cleanliness um, and making sure that it is uh, scrupulously clean what we know from a scientific point of view is is that if we feed colostrum which has a high bacterial load to calves um, then the bacteria that are in that colostrum compete for the same sites on the gut wall that would be used for absorbing the antibodies um, so there's a battle going on there and if we basically load that in the favor of bacteria what those bacteria will do is is block the absorption of good quality antibodies into the calf's blood system uh, so it's really really important that we minimize bacterial loading as po as much as possible um, and this slide shows some Irish work it, it gives you some measured recommendations of what the total bacterial counts of colostrum should be um, and it also highlighted the point that more than half of colostrum from this cohort of Irish dairy farms had bacterial loading greater than the recommendations so something again to think about is making sure that the colostrum that you harvest from a freshly calved cow is as clean as possible it's at the same hygienic standards that you would use uh, if you were going to drink that milk yourself bearing in mind that you know the cow's teats will not have uh, been through a milking parlor for around about eight weeks so there will be possibly slightly more in the way of bacterial load on the cow's teats and also um, the cow might have been up and down during the calving process uh, and, and making sure that the um, the liners of any units plus any milk handling utensils for colostrum are, are scrupulously clean because it's it's really really important to the whole process if we move on to the, the next slide so a few pointers there um, uh, Storage, even in a fridge, counts will rise relatively quickly to unacceptable levels. Um, freezing will work um, in terms of reducing and, and, and limiting bacterial multiplication. Uh, and it's really, really important that any of the utensils we're using around handling colostrum are, are, are as clean as possible. And that includes the good old stomach tube, uh, which is used potentially to, to give colostrum to calves. Next slide, please. Just a, a final point on this, and this is um, questions that we get asked a lot, is around pasteurization and whether this can be used as part of the, the armory that farmers have to maximize colostrum quality. Uh, a lot of the questions around it will be in relation to specific diseases, the likes of Yoni's disease, uh, Mycoplasma bovis, Salmonella Dublin, and um, colostrum pasteurization can be part of the control programs for these disease diseases but in general what what pasteurization will do is it will reduce bacterial load it won't sterilize the milk but it will reduce bacterial load so it will help it will also slightly reduce immunoglobulin levels but only slightly um, so we need to ensure that colostrum quality is good um, and that's the general comment that I would make is, is is with any pasteurization rubbish in rubbish out if we put really dirty poor quality colostrum into a pasteurizer then we'll we'll end up with still 
um, quite high bacterial loads coming out and possibly reduced immune globulin levels. So it's a tool that can be used. Uh, it can be used really quite well as part of an overall measure of control around colostrum management. Uh, and, and some of the, the bits of kit available to do it work well in terms of farm management as well. It, it fits very well with, with the farm staff and how they use it. Um, if we move on to, I think what I've got is a final slide. Um, just want to change tack just right at the end um, and something that, that we talked about at our face-to-face -face meeting back in January was just around calf groupings and uh, quite topical within the dairy industry is whether we singly house calves or house calves in pairs or groups particularly in the first weeks of life um, and some of the interesting data that's particularly coming out of Canada on this shows quite nicely that cows that are calves that are managed in pairs um, will have or, or groups will have higher feed intakes and, and particularly if you pair house calves in the first week of life when they then go on to join a larger group um, then their feed intakes are higher when they join that group um, to start off with so it's quite interesting that uh, as vets, probably we've been slightly guilty of wanting to keep calves individually for reasons of disease control. It's easier to control disease uh, if we limit the spread to other calves. Um, however, there are advantages to pairing them as well. And what we've got to do uh, in any calf rearing system is, is balance the risk of disease spread uh, against the advantages that we might get from um, small group housing or pair housing. Um, and, and that's something that we need to consider going forward. Okay, I think that is me. Um, I'm happy to either take some questions or also perhaps to start off with is to, to bring back in um, some of the farmers and particularly start off with Gareth and Callum on the call, if I may. Uh, can I maybe... just stop, Colin, can I just stop you there just now? Because I've got a few questions that have come in from the panel okay. just on your presentation before we... We bring it back to these guys. There's quite a bit about the room and drinking. So the first question was, what is it? But you answered that. Um, but what can we do to reduce room and drinking, Colin? Yeah, there's quite a few things. And I think some of it starts with, with the calf the minute it's born in that I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I suspect if we have one of these slightly acidotic, slightly compromised calves at birth, then... Uh, that whole cycle of rumen drinking might start at that point. Therefore, um, supplying bicarbonate at that stage, intravenous bicarbonate administered by your vet is a, a good way of doing it. Um, uh, and, and trying to reverse that acidosis at that stage can help. Um, I think there's quite a lot around feeding practices that can help reduce the risk of rumen drinking though. And I think these are the really, really important ones. Um, if they're bucket fed rather than teat fed, uh, then they can drink so, so quickly out of a bucket. You know, you give them two or three litres in a bucket, they can that up so, so quickly that some of that milk will overspill into the rumen. Therefore, feeding them with a teat rather than a bucket just makes the whole process more natural. Uh, it slightly slows down the, the speed at which they drink um, and, and helps put most of that milk in the right place. Um, uh, another one... Um, uh, around that um as, as as well as teat drinking is 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 that if 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 you are feeding individual calves is to maybe give them a liter and then um let them drink a liter and then maybe give them another couple of liters as well after that as in to to slightly slow down the speed at which they're drinking um we've seen that help on some farms just to try and just reduce the speed a little bit um and bear in mind that this is a really vicious circle in that Basically, the more milk ends up in the rumen, the more acid that's produced as the rumen tries to digest that milk by fermentation. The more acid that's produced, the more poorly the esophageal groove works. Therefore, the more milk that ends up in the rumen, therefore, the more acid that's produced. And you just keep going round and round and round and round that circle, which means you end up with these digestive upsets. So um, we've got to try and stop that at the start before it runs out of control. Um, so the calf as it's born plus how much we feed and how we feed it through a teat is is really helpful 
and further to that then, is there a way to identify this room and, room and drinking calves whilst they're still alive? Um, yep. And is there a recommended treatment for those calves? Yeah, so so these calves, um, they, they may scour, um, they may bloat slightly, um, so you might see that occurring. Uh, they may be sort of on and off milk intakes. Uh, they sometimes have a little bit of, of abdominal pain as well. So you might see them that they they don't feed as well for one feed, and then maybe the next feed they're back on and then off again. And they, they kind of come into these problem drinkers that I, I imagine every farmer on this call will will recognize the odd problem drinker that you see uh, where they just don't seem to, to drink well or to suckle well uh, and they come into that category um, and they can be difficult to manage they can be difficult to manage uh, we've got to try and reverse that acidosis so bicarbonate would be the way to do that but also just really consider how we're going to feed them right from the start which is to try and make it as natural as possible through teat feeding rather than than bucket feeding Okay, um, and on to colostrum. Can you measure, oh sorry, um, how much should a calf drink in the first feed? And if you, for example, if he wants five litres, would, would you let him have it or would you recommend not to? So the first feed of colostrum, well, it comes back to 10% to of body weight. So it depends on your calf weight. It'd be interesting, you know, bringing in some of the farmers on on the call on this one. Uh, but from what from what I glean and from what you hear and what you see talking to farmers and being on farms is is that if you can get that calf very much at that stage where it's up on its feet, it's been licked by its mother, it's looking to go and suckle, and you know it's hardwired to go and suckle at that point. Is you know very often if you um, stick a teat uh, and a bottle in front of it at that point if it's a good viable calf it will easily take four liters of colostrum um, now I very happily take the views of, of any of the other farmers on the call who are doing this far more commonly than i am but you know you could intervene at that point and they will very often drink at that point gareth do you want to comment on that because you've got a you've got a different breeds of calves as well so Yes, I, as a as a rule, we we stomach tube everything within the first sort of four hours, with so sort of, as you say up to four liters. But obviously, with the jerseys, that's uh, maybe not physically possible with some of them. So they go with the ten percent rule. If they can take three liters, that's that's more than enough. We have tried bottle feeding a few, but again, I think it comes around that practicality side of things that. It, at 10 o'clock at night, um, the last thing I'm doing is standing, waiting for half an hour with a, a calf to suck out of a teat. So, unfortunately, I think the practicalities of life mean that quite often it's just stomach tubed and then, they say, in our system, the bucket fed. So, we try to get them onto buckets as quick as possible. So, again, it's something Callum's been talking to us about and we're kind of considering this as, you know, moving forward, whether we want to move to teat feeding or not. I don't know whether Cal wanted to, to mention anything on that, but yeah, well, obviously, with respect to Pottstown, what we've found historically is when we've tried to push more milk and more powder, we've seen scours and you know, you know, inappetencies in the calves. So our concern is there's perhaps a bit of room drinking going on there, just as a consequence of feeding high volumes of milk milk through a bucket. So I'm keen for them to change to teats. For certainly for the first certainly for the first few weeks in life to get uh, to, to get them started on a good on a good basis without these sort of health risks because uh, as Colin says rum and drinking is quite tricky to reverse once it starts. Can I bring Willie in? Willie, can you put your camera on a wee second? Because I think you have changed. Is that right? Have you changed yeah. since the meeting? Very much since the meeting, uh, I, I wasn't really aware of what room and drinking was before the, the meeting at Hetland. And uh, since then, with the teat feeders just on the, the calves that were, have been born since then. Uh, so it's, it's early days, but uh, it seems to be working well. And the calves definitely take longer to drink their milk, but it's you know you can see they're they're maybe more vibrant and uh, they seem healthy anyway. We've, we've, we've not had any problems with them so far, but as I say, it's, it's still early days. 
Yeah, perfect. Right, there is another, there's another there's questions flooding in here, so I'm going to give another couple of questions, but especially for the panel. So one of the questions is about freezing. Um, is it better to pasteurise colostrum before freezing or freeze it and pasteurise? I would say, and, and the simplest way of doing it, um, and it's where a lot of the machines would be set up, is to pasteurise first um, and then freeze. Um, and that way you've you've got as clean a product as you can. Um, you've got that colostrum, uh, you've selected it to be as good as quality as you can. Um, you can also make sure that from a, like a Yoni's disease point of view, that the cow is is a negative cow and a low risk cow. So what you're doing is you're then freezing the best quality stuff that you've got, um, and then it's then available for you know easy to use for whatever carving comes comes your way. So if you do it with that system as well, it depends a little bit on Yoni's risk for an individual farm. So every farm will be different, but um, you don't necessarily have to feed the, the mother's colostrum to its own calf, you know, as long as you can be sure that the, the, the standard of the colostrum is good from, from every perspective. Lovely. Um, there was a question, where can I get a refractometer and is a colostrum a colostrum meter good enough? It's, it's certainly good enough. Refractometers, um, I think most wholesalers will be able to get hold of those for you now i'm kind of looking at callum as well here certainly get hold of them yeah. through the vet practices too yeah wholesalers internet you know you should, you easy boards are not expensive yep uh, 23 pound on amazon perfect there you go. um right one can i can i bring craig and william back into this then Callum, you said earlier about measuring colostrum at Pottstown. Um, what are you using to do this? And then once we've answered that, can we just come to the panel and just see what they do as well? So, Callum, what's what's the protocol for that just now? Well, yeah, obviously, the protocol has been uh, set up whereby uh, Gareth, Tom or Jodie are, are stomach tubing the calves at birth, but they're measuring the colostrum before they give it to the calf. So they're taking it as cleanly as they can, storing it cleanly, freezing it often that what they're doing is they're, they're thawing frozen colostrum if they can't use that one individual colostrum and checking it on their bricks refractometer to check for levels uh, and only taking anything above 22 whereby when i'm in on a fortnightly visit in the worst scenario i'm bleeding calves uh, that are less than a week old and i'm doing total proteins on refractometer from there uh, and actually it's I would what I would say to anyone that's out there is we all assume, and this was the case for Pottstown, we all assume when you see the calf suck on the cow that they're, they're taking enough. But when we've sampled those calves retrospectively, we've found that often they've been below where they want to be. So actually forcibly making them take take it via teeth or by stomach tube has uh, made sure our colostrum levels and all those calves have been efficient. Okay, Willie and Craig, do you, so I'll come to Craig first. Craig, do you measure colostrum? Uh, no, I haven't done. It's something I, I sort of keep intending to do in the future, but today I haven't. No. Okay, and Willie, what about yourself? Uh, occasionally we do have a refractometer. <coughs> um, it's one of the practicality things. We, if we're going to freeze it, we'll take it. Uh, if we're feeding it straight away, sometimes we just go on and feed it. Um, if it certainly if it looks if it looks uh, questionable in its quality, we'll test it and see see whether we need to throw out some better stuff or or feed some powder maybe to supplement it. Okay, lovely. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question, Colin, and then we'll move on to Jimmy. And I think we've got we've got more questions coming in, but I'll keep them to the very end. Can you measure bacterial load in colostrum on farm? <coughs> you can't do it on farm um, there are plenty of testing labs that can do it um, uh, and it's a similar sort of technique sometimes it's done on bulk milk to investigate mastitis problems as well or milk quality problems so it's a similar technique to that um, and is is something that can be relatively easy done 
and what we found when when we've done it for farms is it's been a bit of a bit of an eye opener again in that you, you're looking at this colostrum you're doing the best that you can with it and you think it's good and it's only when you actually look at total bacterial counts that you find out just how good it is when at the level that really matters to the calf and, and to the calf's gut i suppose so uh it's been a good tool at highlighting where where things are not as good as they might be and um a, a good tool to then try and help rectify and, and make changes and show that they've been effective so it, it's good in that sense i would probably always start though with with looking at, at total proteins or zsts because if they're good and they're consistently good then that's the end product of the whole process so um you know to my way of thinking more than about 85 percent of of the total protein assessments or the zst assessments that you do should be they should make the grade they should be good and if that's the case we're doing well if that's not the case then we've got to start to drill down in these different areas to think right where where can we improve and what can we do to try and make a difference lovely right thank you very much um time wise i think we need to move on to jimmy so welcome jimmy thank you very much for joining us um i think you're about to share your screen is that yeah well done yeah thanks Noreen. so yeah welcome jimmy and um, we're going to ask you to look about managing young calves um, and looking at the nutritional side as much as anything as well there's still a couple of questions coming in um, that we'll come to at the end because I think you'll cover some of it uh, in your um, presentation but I do still encourage the viewers that are watching if you've got any questions fire them in and we will do our best to bring them up at the end so over to you Jimmy thank you thanks Doreen good afternoon everyone uh, Doreen can I just check can you see my slides up there yeah absolutely fine Good, perfect. Okay. I just realised we spent the last uh, hour uh, talking about the first 24 hours of a calf's life, and it just shows how important uh, that is and the impact that we have in that first 24 hours of what that uh, calf produces uh, for the, the, the rest of its life, really. And I think that's uh, so important. And moving on from there, the next few weeks are, are also equally as important. When we look at some of the statistics of what happens uh, on farm, when we look, the, there's a figure out there of 22% of heifer calves born subsequently die, and I think that's a, a frightening figure. Uh, that the, the losses that are there, and I think there, there's a huge variation on farm. I'm hoping everyone on uh, screen today uh, isn't nearly uh, like that, but I think it's something just to be aware of. Uh, and a further 11% of heifers don't complete their first lactation. So these are some serious numbers that if we can try and minimise that and look after these calves from day one, we can make quite a, a, a big improvement. And the same with age at first calving heifers, what we're trying to achieve is a healthy calf coming into the herd uh, as economically as possible and as productive as possible. The average age in the UK is uh, tw calving is 27 months, and obviously the target is trying to get to uh, 22 to 24 months. And there's good benefits of achieving calving at that age. We, we know going below 22 months is probably not uh, a good idea, not as productive, but 22 to 24, maybe even pushing towards 25 as an average across the herd, uh, is, a, is a good productive age to calve heifers at. The other side of that is why do we need replacements? Uh, every herd needs replacements. The average cull rate in the UK is about 28%. So we, we have lots of reasons why we cull cows out the herd, uh, but we need replacements to come in. And every dairy herd in the UK has a approximately 30% of it as heifers come in, in there as replacements. So uh, we, we need these replacements healthy and looking at where, where we go forward with that herd. And a comment to ask uh, everyone is how many cows leave the herd at no value? Because again, it's back to what is the replacement rate? What is the cull rate? How do we manage the, the dairy herd overall and making sure that uh, cows are looked after as much as possible and replaced appropriately? Over the last few years, sex semen is not a new phenomenon. Well, sex semen has been allowed along, around for a long while, but we've seen quite an increase in use of sex semen uh, more recently. And you can see the HDB figures here from 2020 that now uh, more than 50% of dairy semen is uh, sex. And we're now a couple of years on from that. I would expect that that will be growing e even more so. 
And you can see uh, the share of dairy semen versus beef semen. No surprise, we're seeing a, a, an increase in beef semen uh, sales total uh, and a, a decrease in dairy semen. Interestingly, you would expect that we would see uh, an increase in heifers overall. We have seen a reduction in dairy bull calves coming through, which is uh, probably a good thing looking at value of these over the past few years. So we're seeing quite a reduction in uh, dairy bull calves on farm and a consequent increase of, uh, no, uh, of either text or beef uh, uh, calves coming in. But interestingly, overall, back 10 years ago with 133,000 heifers estimated uh, in, the, in, in the, the industry, uh, and that has actually reduced slightly. So despite us using a lot more uh, sex semen, we don't actually have more heifers on the ground. And I know in some herds we, we are seeing that, we are seeing an increase in heifers, but not necessarily across the whole industry. So heifer replacements are still very important in terms of numbers that we, we have coming into the herd. So, why do we talk so much about carbon heifer rearing? The highest genetic potential animals on the farm. Uh, overall, they'll produce the most lifetime milk. An interesting uh, uh, statement here, animals born out of heifers will produce more milk. And that's where the, the heifer calf that's born out of heifer is uh, been growing when that heifer is not producing milk, so that calf is slightly better. And conception rate of heifer calves out of heifers is marginally better as well. What are we aiming for? Low calf mortality. Uh, we want less than 2%. Some milk companies are now uh, putting targets on farms in terms of what they're looking at for calf mortality. And we want fast early growth uh, for good lifetime performance. We know feed conversion efficiency will be good uh, early on, so we want to make the most of that. And we want to aim to be serving uh, heifers between 13 and 15 months, and ideally at 55 to 60% of mature weight. So obviously that depends on uh, breed. And more importantly, we want to grow these uh, heifers as good frame and strength that uh, avoid excess fat deposition. So diet composition is then important to make sure we get uh, good lean muscle and uh, bone growth. We want to then calve down at 22 to 24 months of age and probably around about 85 to 90% of mature weight at that stage and less than 10% leaving in the first lactation to maximise profitability. So yeah, I've just said best feed conversion at that young age, and that early growth that we can get, if we can improve early growth, we're going to get that that advantage uh, stays with that heifer all the way through its life, and we will see uh, increased performance, increased milk production in that early lactation if we get uh, good early growth, and roughly about 225 litres in that first lactation for every extra 0.1 kilogram of daily live weight gain that we can achieve uh, in, in that first few weeks of that calf's life. I've put some questions up here that you can all answer, looking at where are we at just now and what is your calf rearing actually achieving? And I'll open this up to our uh, panel of farmers. Uh, Willie, what, what's your current age at calving? What are you achieving and how do you sort of judge that? Uh, yeah, our uh, current we average about 25 months for our current uh, average age at first calving. Uh, and even that, we try to do as best we can with the calf rearing, just trying to follow all the things that we've spoken about. And uh, when it comes to select for bulling, is, is it, or the next one we go, we look at all of those things between age and weight, look at them, we start off with age and uh, see if they're look big enough, strong enough to bull, then we'll go into that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks, Willie. Uh, Craig, do you want to comment on that? What are you sort of trying to achieve or what are you trying to aim for? Yeah, at the moment um, we are in the 24 months of preparing for, for uh, a calving age. Similar to Willie, um, when we're selecting for bullying, we've got to start with the age, um, and then you know if they're sort of maybe not so well grown, they might get held back, or if they're a little bit ahead, you know, we'll let them go on. Um, and similarly, weaning, we'll be about 10 weeks for weaning, but an odd calf that maybe hasn't done so well, we'll hold it back a little bit. Just try and catch up. Just going back to your end slide about you know how the growth is in better feed conversion at your age. I think you know, the cats, once they're weaned, if they're, they're in good sort of shape, carrying a bit of weight and, and, and healthy looking, you know, that sort of stands them in good stead post weaning. Um, and I think 
Right, those cars take it a little bit easier to manage. The other ones that are maybe not done so well, three wheeling, so just give them a little bit extra TLC. Try not to have too many of them. <laughs> I think I can help it. Yep. No, good. Thank you. Gareth, do you want to comment anything about uh, what happens at Pottstown? Yeah, well, I say we're, we're current age of carbon is about 24 months, which is where we're aiming for. We've maybe had a slight change in policy over the last year because we felt, even though some of them were probably up to weight at, you know, 12 and a half, 13 months, we've kind of stopped the eye in them at that age and maybe waiting to that 13 and a half, 14 and a half months. Just uh, we found some of them, even though they were they were at the right weight when we eyed them. If they got a problem in the next year, it was maybe just a bit too harsh on them. So we're, we've kind of gone, you know, they just have to be that bit older, even if they are looking okay and and at the right weight. Weaning-wise, we probably go a wee bit earlier. Uh, traditionally, we used to wean at six weeks. We've probably in the last 10 years brought that up to about eight weeks. I get it would do it in groups. So it's, uh, you know, I suppose it's 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 done on age essentially. It's like Craig and Willie were saying, you know, you will hold one back if it's if it's struggling, but we do try not to move them groups as well. Uh, we do it gradually. Uh, as I said before, we're bucket fed as well, so we maybe just struggle to get the the amount of powder in that we'd maybe like to. We're sitting about six uh, seven hundred and fifty grams a day, roughly a, a hundred and fifty gram concentration. So uh, that's part of the conversation I suppose from before is a different way of feeding we can maybe push that up slightly. Okay thanks Gareth. Uh, Craig and Willie do you want to comment a little bit just in terms of uh, amount of milk powder as well are you at 750 are you higher than that? Uh, yeah we're actually a bit higher than that um, especially this we generally run about a kilo and this time of year when it's colder we've actually stepped up a little bit so they're uh, the calves is going to build up when they're about two or three weeks old, they'll step up to about 1.1 1 .1, uh, and they run on that till they're sort of 60 days and then we'll gradually wean them down a little bit, try and get them to eat a bit more uh, pellets and go that way. Okay, yeah. yeah. My, my webcam is good. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but the webcam uh, doesn't want to work. But we, uh, we feed 900 grams of powder, so six litres a day, putting out an automatic calf machine. Um, first week we have calves in single pens just to sort of get them up and going. And we try and give them about six litres to a, to a bucket in the street um, and then you know get them really going. Uh, and then well we just done the sort of standard curve for weaning uh, with the calf machine. So some kind of 40 days or probably 47 days, 40 days in the machine we're starting to drop the, the amount um, and that tails off. Um, so I, I just drop them down gradually until they get to that sort of 60 plus days. They're getting just kind of 0.4 or 0.6 uh, things a day. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. Well, you made a comment about uh, this time of year, giving them a little bit more milk powder to uh, just uh, give them a little bit more energy. Callum, do you want to make some comment in here? Because we've had a discussion about calf jackets as well. Okay, I'm looking at my camera back on. <laughs> Hold on, right, sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, we are, um, yeah, generally critical temperature of a calf at a newborn is eight degrees, you know, and so we're very much uh, of, of proactively trying to encourage calf jackets because uh, cold stress is a big indicator in calves. So you know, when I go back to that critical body temperature, um, you know, a calf under uh, eight degrees temperature, which is the environmental temperature of today, for instance, they're burning energy to keep warm. So, uh, and if there's a draft there or dampness there, that, that temperature goes up even further. So we do not want to see calves that are burning energy just to keep warm because it's very inefficient. So calf jackets are very much a practice protocol and Pottstown are now currently using uh, calf jackets on all their calves. Uh, and we would generally say if the ambient temperature is below 10 degrees, we would advocate a calf jacket. Thank you. Okay, well, any other comments? Or we'll, I think we'll move on. Yeah, just move Terms on, Jimmy. Okay, thanks, Doreen. Uh, 
what we then want to look at is what the requirements and objectives uh, of these calves, looking at what growth rates are we look, looking at. Obviously, the important thing of room and development and health, which Colin has covered uh, mainly, and then looking at energy and protein, fibre, and then finishing off in water. So, what kind of growth rates and how do we judge uh, of what we're trying to look at? That ideally we're wanting to uh, probably double birth weight uh, by by weaning time, but again, depends a little bit of where our starting point is and do we measure by uh, weight? Do we manage, measure by height in terms of where we're getting to uh, for bulling? But to achieve these sort of things, uh, we're looking. I think we've agreed that eight to ten weeks is uh, probably fairly usual. We want to double birth weight, and also I think Craig made a comment uh, about uh, starter feed as well. We want them to be eaten plenty uh, at weaning so that we don't get a check. So ideally, about a kilo and a half of feed, and where we're uh, dropping milk down gradually, you'll see a pretty significant increase in that uh, hard feed intake just over these few days. But Obviously, again, how do you judge calves going to be healthy, calves not to be stressed when it's at weaning, and obviously gradually weaning is definitely recommended. What sort of growth rates we're achieving? Again, obviously depends a bit on breed, but if we're looking what weight is a calf at birth, uh, a black and white calf is probably between 40 and 45 uh, kilos. Uh, Gareth's Jersey calves probably around about 30, 30 plus. Uh, some of some a bit young, uh, a bit smaller, I would suggest as well, Gareth. Uh, so as a weaning weight, we want, want to then double that. So for a, a black and white, we're looking between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8 kilos a day to achieve that. And for a jersey between probably 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 uh, to try and get to that uh, double birth weight at uh, 10, 10 weeks of age. What variation do we see uh, across herds? Uh, Colin kindly gave a slide. Uh, and when you look at some of the uh, growth rates uh, for young calves, for upper herds, uh, first uh, couple of weeks, only maybe half a kilo a day. Uh, medium herds 0.3 and lower uh, category herds are actually gaining zero weight. And that's uh, obviously that calf is standing still doing nothing for that first 30 days. When we then look at sort of 30 to 60 days, we're seeing that growth rate increase slightly and upper herds at 0.66, uh, lower herds down uh, only a third of a kilo a day, uh, which is quite well off what the target we're trying to aim for. I'm not going to talk a lot about health, but it's interesting when you look at what affects growth rate on farm. Uh, and this just shows an example of calves that are healthy opposed to calves that are not healthy. Uh, and you can see quite a significant uh, change in that growth rate that calves are achieving uh, when they're not healthy. So obviously, stemming back to colostrum again, that's the most important thing to try and boost the immune system and keep that calf healthy as much as possible through the early growth stage. This is uh, back to Pottstown in terms of the uh, daily live weight gain of uh, the, the calves that have been measured uh, over uh, the last couple of months. And one of the main comments I'll make is just the, the, the variation uh, in a herd with a uh, small number. This is only over a few months that has been measured, obviously, uh, different breeding in here as well with the different colours, but just shows uh, the variation in there. And again, Callum, do you want to uh, comment at this point? Yeah, well, obviously, the three key things to growth rates are nutrition, environment, and disease. So nutrition is the one thing that we would think is a constant. So uh, our concern at Portstown is obviously we're concerned with cold stress and actually the benefits of calf jackets have been proven quite uh, considerably when we did a, a very early trial comparing every second calf got a calf jacket and the growth rates were, were far better than the calves that didn't have jackets. Um, obviously, the the boys have got a very good attention to detail, so disease currently isn't that high, but we are intending to scan uh, weaned calf's chest just to see if there is any subclinical pneumonia, because obviously pneumonia grumbling in the background could be pulling some of these weights, uh, gross weights down in some of these calves, so we're going to do a trial where we're going to scan all the calves' lungs to see if there is disease there, and firstly, if they've been treated and seen, or if they haven't and they've been subclinical. Um, the boys are generally very good at picking up disease, and Jody. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting trial for us to look at. 
Can I just ask okay. a question um, before you move on, Jimmy? There's a question came in here. Um, at what age, how, what age, up to what age should a calf wear a jacket? Sorry. Just while we've got Callum there. Well, our practice protocol is ultimately it can stay on as long as it wants, but often, you know, jackets, we generally would say up to four weeks of age, because at that point, the calf is far uh, more able to, to cope with cold temperatures. Now, we talk about the critical temperature of a newborn calf being eight degrees. Once it's a week, two, three, four weeks of age, that temperature drops considerably. So um, generally speaking, you know, just as a basic protocol, we would say, uh, as long as the ambient temperature is below 10 degrees, they wear a calf jacket up to four weeks of age. Now, some of our clients will keep them on ultimately just to about when they wean, you know, so there's no fast rule, but I would generally say it wants to be three to four weeks at least. Okay, that's lovely. Okay, Jimmy, carry on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Callum. So what we're trying to do to achieve growth, we want energy for maintenance and growth. Uh, we want protein for bone and muscle growth and development. Uh, we want some fibre in there for rumen development. And we also need water uh, for rumen development, optimal growth as well. It's a uh, crucial uh, nutrient as well, and quite often a forgotten nutrient. So and in terms of whether it's milk or milk powder, uh, given the increasing price of uh, milk powder, do we consider back to whole milk? But again, it's making sure we've got consistent quality uh, into that calf to supply energy and protein. Potentially between five and eight litres uh, of milk per calf, <laughs> who feeds uh, per day, depends on the system, how that is actually achieved. Uh, but interestingly, how much does a a suckle calf drink, so uh, very difficult to measure. I was looking at some suckle cows yesterday watching calves drinking with no idea how much they drink, but some people have measured it and they reckon a, a suckle calf could probably drink up to 12 litres of milk. So, and we've uh, had some dairy calves on ad lib milk, and again, they'll easily eat, uh, drink 10 litres of milk uh, quite happily. And we've discussed this earlier as well in terms of uh, total milk powder, and probably uh, the norm is somewhere between 750 and a kilo of milk powder per head per day. Uh, depends on concentration, anything from uh, uh, 125 grams up to 165 grams uh, per litre uh, to uh, supply that amount of powder to achieve that growth that we're looking for. Moving on from their starter feed, uh, probably introduced uh, very early on in that calf's life, so they get it used to it. Essential for maintenance, growth, and rumen development in particular. Uh, what Colin was saying that uh, milk will not uh, go into the rumen, so we need uh, the starter feed and water and fibre there to uh, start that rumen development. And uh, we're looking the first uh, few days, absolutely minimal amount of intake for just a matter of grams, but that will increase rapidly. Uh, even with the amount of milk going into them, we still expect that uh, starter feed to increase uh, quite significantly uh, over the even through that milk feeding period, and ideally up to about a kilo and a half plus uh, at weaning to uh, allow that calf to to grow. We well, obviously want some uh, gradual weaning as well. Uh, it has a, a huge uh, impact in that starter feed and the intake of starter feed uh, over that, that period. In terms of starter feed, it must be palatable. Uh, calves, we, the calves don't know what it is to start with. They need to learn what it is that needs to be uh, tasty. They, they need to uh, want to eat it. It's got to be high quality ingredients and a mixture of uh, starch, fibre and protein sources we want in there. We don't want it too starchy. Uh, we want a, a balance of nutrients in there and a balance of feeds uh, to, to help that rumen development. As far as I'm concerned, 18% crude protein as a starter feed is adequate uh, for, for young calves. Uh, that's sufficient to grow uh, frame and muscle. Uh, we don't, that, that provides the requirement. We don't really need any more uh, crude percentage crude protein. But more important probably to that as well as intake, we need them to eat that amount of feed so that they get the grams of protein uh, and energy that they need to, to develop and grow rather than having too high a, a concentration of protein.
Forage, at a young stage, the, the rumen is not developed at all, and uh, they're not able to digest a lot of forage, but it's uh, vital in terms of getting that rumen developed overall uh, to convert into energy and get that uh, uh, overall growth. We need a little bit of forage in there as a scratch factor, but the concentrating water is important too to develop overall, the, uh, the get the rumen development there. Calves will not consume a lot. Early on, they might, if it's straw, they'll only maybe eat about 100 grams. It's not a, a huge amount of straw at all, but that's sufficient to get uh, the, the rumen development started. And we had a debate in the face-to-face -face meeting about uh, sort of types of forage as well. I tend to favour uh, straw. We know it's uh, not high nutrient value, but in reality, we don't want the calf to eat a huge amount of it. We're not expecting it to supply a lot of nutrient. What I've found is where we supply a, a, a higher nutrient value forage, the calves will actually consume a little bit more of it, but because the rumen is undeveloped, they can't actually digest it. So it ends up, we end up with a, a little bit of a uh, pot-bellied calf because they, they consume the forage, but uh, they don't. They haven't the, the ability to actually digest it properly. So by feeding them straw, we don't get high intakes. But in reality, that's what we want uh, because it helps develop the rumen without uh, creating too much indigest, indigested forage. There is a benefit from sorry. Just going back on, there is benefit of chopping that straw to get that little bit more into them to uh, help with digestion as well. And yeah, water, we need water uh, as free water because it goes into the rumen rather than milk. Uh, going to have amazing, as Colin explained earlier. So we need that to help uh, create the right environment uh, to, to develop the rumen and create the sort of rumen uh, microbiome. So we uh, develop that over time. Uh, and the, the combination of the, the forage, the water and the grain uh, are concentrate in there uh, just helps uh, the overall of that rumen to develop and digest forage overall. And there's quite a bit of research showing that uh, that free access it helps digestion of the forage, helps digestion of the concentrate, uh, and uh, we'll see better gain of calves that have been uh, given water as well because they're getting better digestibility out of the concentrate feed that they're getting access to. And obviously a bit healthier as well. Okay, so overall, looking at what target live weight gain we need to achieve, and we see a large variation within a farm, let alone across farms. But the important thing uh, is to monitor that, and that's obviously ongoing at uh, Pottstown to measure and monitor uh, more closely just what the, the calf growth rates are, and uh, we can uh, react on that. And that early life growth is so important uh, to make sure that heifer is strong and healthy and uh, profitable when it comes into, into the herd. And it's then looking to get the balance of the adequate nutrition, whether that's milk, forage, or uh, concentrate feed to support growth, but also to get a good room and development so that it can then digest plenty of forage uh, once it grows uh, a bit larger. Okay, thanks, Doreen. Back to you. Lovely, thank you very much. Colin, can I just ask you to come back up? We have got two or three questions here, so I'm going to try and fire through them um, as best as I can. Um, someone's asked if they can get your opinion on higher fat powders versus higher protein powders. Who wants to take that one? I'll Jimmy? let Jimmy take that one, please. Okay, happy to talk on that. And there's uh, been quite a lot of uh, discussion on that in the market over the last few years, and a few higher, uh, higher fat products coming on the market. The when you look at whole milk, uh, whole milk is higher fat than it is uh, protein. When you look at butter fat and protein levels, which is what we're trying to uh, match. Most important thing is the digestibility of that fat as well, uh, making sure that the calf can utilize that fat. So the, the, the type of fat in the, the powder is then very important. Uh, and we're looking at that balance between energy and protein and digestibility to make sure we get the, the growth out of it. There has been some discussion about a hard feed, concentrate feed, along with different uh, different uh, types of milk powder as well. And again, that's back to digestibility to make sure that they uh, still encourage 
hard feed intake as well, rather than limiting hard feed. So yeah, they're both uh, suitable powders, but to match uh, whole milk, uh, higher fat products work pretty well. Okay, so on, on, a, on another one of that, for our substitute colostrum, the label says two litres per calf for the first two feeds. Does the 10% rule not apply for this? And do I follow the packet instructions to give the calf more depending on weight? So it's a, a, big, uh, a big area of discussion, this, um, which uh, I can try and add a bit to it. So th there's, there's different types of colostrum replacers or substitutes. Uh, and first comment would be is, is, is that there is no substitute for the real thing if it's available, uh, in my view. Um, uh, as long as it is available in sufficient quantity and quality, which we've already discussed. So that would be the, the first point that I would make is, is, is try everything in your power to go for the real thing. Although I would acknowledge entirely that I've never, it's, it's rare to see a farm that's got lots and lots of surplus colostrum sitting around waiting to be given to calves. It seems that, you know, we're always tight for it. Um, uh, so as far as the the ingredients for uh, it depends very much on the specific product what the spec of the product is um uh, and whether that is specced out in terms of uh its nutrition in terms of fat and protein or whether it is in terms of its immunoglobulin so it i can't specifically answer the question right here right now but it really does depend on the spec of the product um and i I, I, certainly in terms of volume, I would always be erring on the side of, of more rather than less up to those sort of 10% targets. Hopefully that answers it. I don't know whether, Jimmy, you've got anything else to add on that in terms of specific products? Yeah, I guess it's looking at the product in terms of the IgGs that are uh, provided to make sure we're putting the full, the full amount in, uh, whether it's, as you say, a substitute or a... Uh, a supplement that that's there so yeah depends depends on what's there and i agree with you colin uh, the real stuff is the best stuff colostrum is gold and um, yep. is it better to feed the colostrum immediately or wait two hours to pasteurize it um the clock's ticking that's the first thing to say um so the sooner that that calf can get colostrum the better um i would also acknowledge entirely that you know there's different times of day and night that this is happening farmers are busy people uh and you know this is happening you know during the day during the night all the rest of it so we've, we've got to try and make the best of it in all circumstances but i think it's always always good to have an idea i suppose as a farmer of what would be gold standard in terms of the perfect way of doing it and and try and get as close to that within reason of you know time of day or other activities and all the rest of it because because of, of how busy farmers are um so um it's probably uh, i you know, naturally you know you the first hour of life is is really taken up with that that calf learning to get onto its feet to be licked by its mother to get its respiratory rate going get its lungs functioning and and, and just get started and then it's usually naturally in that sort of second hour of life that a calf's going to head for a teat and start to drink so that's probably the one to focus on because that's where absorption will be maximal um so there's a bit of a guide there the other thing on on pasteurization though is that i think for simplicity the best systems with pasteurizers are that you've already got pasteurized milk there ready to go um and speaking to a lot of farmers that use this system they they like it um uh, and the idea really is, is is that you would have a bank of pasteurized good quality clean low risk yonis colostrum in a freezer ready to go um and you know as you see a cow calving you 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 defrost that colostrum and get that process going and then it is available to give to the calf at the right time uh, and that's probably the best way of approaching it rather than thinking right i've got to pasteurize it before i stick mother's colostrum into a calf that has just been born from that mother so that's probably the way i would approach it um 
the only caveat I would put to that is, is you know, it depends very much on individual farm situation around Yoni's disease um, uh, in that it really does, uh, if Yoni's is a big problem in a herd, then then trying to sort of feed mother's colostrum to a calf might be a, a lower risk option. But it depends very much on the, the risk assessment for Yoni's in those particular herds, which, which can easily be worked through with your vet. Okay, um, and for the want of time, I've got a couple of hopefully quicker questions. Jimmy, um, what's the optimum age to wean from fresh milk to powder? I'm not sure there's an optimum in terms of, uh, again, depends what happens on farm. Quite a number of farms that will go straight from colostrum onto powder. So uh, we're, you're probably talking a couple of days, uh, making sure you've got that colostrum in there uh, and then move straight onto powder. Uh, it depends. Uh, legally, milk's got to be kept out of the tank for four or five days. So it depends on individually farms if that milk's uh, available, whether uh, we, we continue to feed cows for four or five days, but certainly the, the first uh, 48 hours is most important to get the colostrum in, then we can move on to powder. Okay, and on average, how long would it take or should it take for a calf to suck four litres feed? You're talking about 20 minutes to half an hour of sucking that is, is you know, pretty constant and working well. Okay. So it takes time. And last question. Unfortunately, there is other questions that are in the chat, but we will come back to everybody individually. Does feed intake of 1.5 kilograms include forage? No, no, that's concentrated feed. That's concentrated feed. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm just going to move on and talk a little bit more about what's happening with EHDB um, and what's coming up. So Shape the Future is um, happening at the moment. We are encouraging all our levy payers at the, just now to register in order for you to have your say in how your levy is paid, spent going forward. The uh, closing date for this is the 31st of March in order for you to have your say in the spring. So really encourage everybody that's watching today, if you could uh, register now, then that would be brilliant. We hope that you're seeing the We Eat uh, Balance campaign that's been um, happening over January. It's in the shape of an advert. It's in the social media. We've also got it at um, point of sale in the supermarkets. And we've got farmers that are interacting just now as well with banners going up and also sharing social media tweets as well. So I do encourage you, everybody, to get involved. For future events for EHDB Dairy, can you go on your, or if you go on the website, you will see face-to-face -face events and webinars that are available throughout the country. And also on social media, we have got lots of activity going on as well. So if you want to see what we've been up to or what we're up to or what's coming up, then I encourage you to follow us and also um, share what, what you're doing as well out there. GB Calf Week is happening just now. As you can see, um, we're on the Friday the 4th, so this is this is what's been happening since Wednesday. They are all available on the website if you want to go back on and have a little look at, at what has been happening if you haven't already taken part in it. But I'd also encourage you to get involved in the next five days as well. There's other things coming up. The website um, is the um, address there is, is where you'll find all that information. So it just, for me now to say a huge thank you to everybody. Thank you for dialing in for those watching and thank you very much for my speakers and my farmers for joining us today. We do have um, an, a face-to-face -face meeting coming up in Ayrshire with exactly this topic once again with Colin and um, Jimmy. So if anybody wants to come along to that, please register and let us know that you, you'd like to turn up for that for that face-to-face -face event. Um, Pottstown's next meeting is the 24th of March and it's looking at the cows themselves and going back a step almost as well for looking at what those cows are producing in order for us to get that good high quality colostrum through their, um, their feed and nutrition. So a huge thank you. Thank you very much um, and hope to see you all out and about soon. <laughs>